This past week, two different sources confirmed that we have reached price parity with electric vehicles to gas cars. This has been predicted for a while, and why it's important is it's speculated that once electric vehicles reach price parity with gas cars, the adoption rate will dramatically increase because it ceases to be a political thing or an ethical thing. Uh, it just makes good financial sense in order to purchase an electric car after the point that they reach price parity. And according to these two sources that has occurred this past week, two sources in question are the Simon Fraser Public Research University in British Columbia. They provide studies for the uh, nation of Canada. And this is an annual study that they release once per year. And according to the study that was just released this year, price parity has been achieved. <clears throat> the second source that I am uh, came across this past week is EVgo released their Q2 investor earning report. And in there, there is citation for uh, electric vehicles reaching price parity and continuing on where the cost of electric vehicles will be below uh, gas cars. I'll get to that in just a second. Very quickly though, I wanna go over the advantages and disadvantages of owning an electric vehicle. I know that most of the people watching this are already aware of this, but just for background information in case anyone's coming across uh, this video who's new to electric vehicles, there are pros and cons. Uh, some of the uh, pros are it's pretty easy to drive, and I put this into a table format. I'm not sure if it's easy to read or not, but I'll go over each one of these in a little bit more detail in the subsequent slides. But just showing that, you know, yes, there are reasons that it's a better choice to choose an electric vehicle, and there are reasons why it's not a good reason to choose an electric vehicle. If you want to go over this table in detail, feel free to pause the video. I'm going to move on. Okay, so benefits. When you have an electric vehicle, it has a large battery. Uh, typically, they place the battery underneath the floorboards of the passengers, and what that does is this heavy battery creates a low center of gravity. So the driving dynamic of an electric vehicle it has a very low center of gravity, which makes handling uh, different than an electric than a non-electric vehicle, where the engine block is higher up, and you can tend to get more sway with an electric vehicle. The base is more solid. Also, they have something called instant torque. Nowadays, electric cars are the fastest cars on the planet. So every time you see a new supercar. Typically, it'll have the 0 to 60 um, rating courtesy of either a hybrid battery and electric motor in order to give it a jump start or a pure battery electric. Um, so it's just it, pure physics. The uh, electric cars are faster. They don't have transmissions in order to cycle through. They just psh, off they go. Uh, thirdly, they're very quiet. So without the internal combustion engine going through its cycles and making noise and vibrations, electric cars are much more smooth. So these things create a dy dynamic for uh, drivers, which is advantageous. It's it's a something that um, internal combustion cars has kind of been seeking for, but it just comes, all these things come naturally with electric cars. Secondly, macroeconomics, uh, considering the a uh, nation having to spend money to import foreign petroleum products uh, goes away if everyone starts using electric cars. And I do want to pause here for just a moment. The nation of Ethiopia has begun producing electricity from a dam. And their economy has become unstable as a result of importing petroleum products. So that in a very stunning move, they've ceased allowing the import of internal combustion engine cars. The only thing that is um, allowed through are electric cars. So although it's a very abrupt change and there's not really infrastructure, they have sufficient electricity generation and uh, the, the country has decided to forge a path towards electrification of its transportation in the uh, private sector by making government policy that forbids the import of electric of uh, non-electric cars into the country. So that's a pretty significant thing. And if you think about it, it just makes sense. Why do I want to support 
foreign countries by purchasing petroleum when I could generate the electricity myself for my um, citizens in order to get around. It just makes more sense. Uh, thirdly, and this is a bit of a political topic, but the uh, climate change is alleviated if you move to an electric car, uh, at least to some extent. If you want to be a conscientious citizen and help with the decarbonization of the transportation sector, you can get an electric car. Personally, that's not a big motivator for me. I guess I'm overly selfish or something. I don't know. But the uh, climate change for me is just not something that overly motivates me. But it is something that is often called out. Thirdly, um, the electric cars currently are heavily subsidized, both from state entities and the federal government. So there are plenty of benefits, financial, to purchasing an electric car because it drives down the sunk cost of the initial purchase. The study from Canada is um, reflecting the subsidies that the government in Canada offers its citizens, but it's still very similar to the United States. And um, then these bottom three, the stability of fuel costs. When you have an electric car, your fuel doesn't go up and down tied to geopolitics because of petroleum fluctuations. It's tied to electricity, so your electrical rate is very stable, and so you know what your your cost for fuel will be. The only real fluctuation that I see is whether or not I drive farther. And it's my it's the distances that I drive in a given period that really is the only fluctuation I see. My, my energy costs remain the same. More reliable EVs break down because it said that they have two thirds fewer moving parts. Let's just run through some of the parts that an electric car does not have. It doesn't have a transmission. It doesn't have an oil pan. It doesn't really have a radiator in the traditional sense of the word doesn't have a serpentine belt, doesn't have the uh, muffler, um, the exhaust system doesn't have spark plugs, uh, it doesn't have all that. So it's a much more simpler car, two thirds fewer moving parts, fewer things to break, very reliable. I've had uh, no problems with my two electric vehicles um, and we paid nothing in service whatsoever, no oil changes. Um, we're getting ready to rotate or uh, replace the tires on the Volvo because it's almost three years old with almost 50,000 miles, but really that's it. You replace the windshield wiper blades every 20,000 miles. You uh, get new tires every 50,000, 50, 40,000 miles and um, uh, put in windshield washer fluid. Really that's it. And lastly, more convenient. Now this is dependent on if you're able to charge in your home. If you're not, this is not a benefit. And I'll go to that in the next slide. So disadvantages. So the batteries are gonna degrade over time. And there is a cited study that says you'll lose 12% of your range after you've driven 200,000 miles. So there's that to expect. Secondly, if you're going to go on a road trip, you're not going to be able to go the 300 to 500 miles that a gas car can typically go. Now, if you average 50 miles an hour, 300 to 500 miles is somewhere between 6 and 10 hours in the car. Now, for me, this is not an issue because I never filled up my tank and drove 10 hours um, straight. So I don't really mind this, but I have to concede that you can't go as far in an electric car. An electric car, you could typically go between 200 and 300 miles. So to put that in perspective, if you're averaging 50 miles an hour, that is between four and six hours of continuous driving on the interstate. Thirdly, um, if you cannot charge at home, uh, is a hassle in order to fuel your vehicle currently because we don't have proliferation of chargers throughout communities like we do with gas stations. So if you don't have a way of charging at work and you don't have a way of charging at home, it's a disadvantage for sure. But if you do have a way of charging at home, you have to spend the money in order to install a level two charger. Now, right now my Volvo XC40 recharge is plugged into the wall socket because I've recently changed jobs and I take a train to work. So I just have to drive to and from the train station. So there's very little consumption of energy on a daily basis. So just plugging it into the wall is sufficient for me. But if you have 20, 30, 40 miles of commute on a routine basis, you're gonna need a level two charger, which means you're gonna need an electrician. You're gonna to have to have permits. And um, we did two things in our house. Firstly, we installed a wall-mounted Tesla uh, 
what do they call it? A Tesla wall charger, I think is what it's called, or a universal charger, something like that. Because our first car was a Tesla Model 3. And so we had uh, Renew Energy Solutions install it for us. And it's been working fine. And actually, what that's what we're using now for our non-Teslas. We just got an adapter to change the uh, J3400 plug into a uh, J1770. Um, 17, um, 7, 1772 J1772 plug, pardon me. Um, and uh, it works fine for both of our cars. So right now my wife's uh, Cadillac is in the garage charging on the Tesla uh, wall connector and I'm charging on a level one connector and it's, it's working just fine for us. But we also had a NEMA 1450 installed when we got the second ele electric car because we thought that might be necessary and just to have it as a convenience. So we actually have two ways. We've got a NEMA 1450 in the outlet that we could plug in a portable charger, and we have the Tesla wall box, both installed by Renew Energy. Both times we had to spend money in order to get that done. Okay, so just to summarize, EVs have benefits and they have disadvantages. Generally though, given all things being equal in price, people will generally choose the EV because there's more benefits than disadvantages. So that's where we are with this price parity discussion. And now let's get into the data. The study from Canada pitted a Volkswagen ID4 with a Honda CRV and did road trip comparisons. Uh, this isn't actually into the price parity discussion yet, but it was part of the study, so I thought I'd go over this very quickly as well. We'll get to the price parity slides here in just a second. But if you read the fine print at the bottom, what they're saying is that they charged up at home and they consumed 80% of the battery. The, the assumption is that they consumed 80% of the battery before their first public DC fast charge. And then they did a average rate for public DC fast charging in Canada in order to obtain these numbers. And as you could see, every single trip that was um, studied, it costs less to travel in an electric vehicle. Why would you not choose an electric vehicle? What, more reliable, costs less to travel, uh, the fuel is more, it's, anyway, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get off my soapbox real quick. Let's go ahead and get into the uh, price parity of it because that's really what this video is about. Firstly, EVgo in their second quarter investor relation slide deck, had these numbers. And I want to draw everyone's attention right down here where it says 66 gigawatt hours up 164%. That means that electric vehicle adoption is increasing because 164% increase in the total amount of energy delivered through the entire EVgo network indicates that a lot more people are using it. All these numbers are up. There are no down numbers. But over here is talking about affordability. Uh, EV sale price expected to be lower than ICE in 2026. Lower than ICE in 2026. Better car, cost less. You tell me what's going to happen. So the total cost of ownership currently in 2024 is lower than ICE. And we'll see the specifics in the Canadian study slides here coming up in just a second. But I think it's worth noting that in one week, two sources, the Canadian study and the EVgo second quarter slide deck, both were citing price parity having been achieved. These are the Canadian studies. They go in four different categories. First, starting with hatchbacks, they pit a Chevy Bolt, which has been discontinued, and they actually point that out here further on down, against a Corolla. And the break-even point is two months after purchase for the Chevrolet Bolt. Um, the total cost of ownership over 10 years is 48% greater for the Corolla. And this is current data. You can look at the specifics in these two bar graphs, how they obtain those numbers. And again, this is a Canadian government study from a university that does this out of due course. These are not um, people with a uh, agenda trying to make statistics fit a narrative. This is just a government study coming up with uh, what is uh, the current situation for electric vehicles versus, versus internal combustion. And why the government needs to know this is it affects their policy decision making. So right now, electric vehicles for the Chevrolet Bolt versus the Corolla 
is a two month break even point. Data is being displayed. Let's go to the next one. For sedans, the Tesla Model 3 versus the Lexus ES250 all wheel drive is already cheaper. So straight out of the gate, you don't, you don't have any break even point shortly after. And the reason why the cost is 49,990 versus 49,250, it's lower for the Lexus, but this one has rebates uh, coming from the federal government. So you start off with a lower cost car that just gets cheaper over time. And so it's 61 more percent um, expensive to uh, purchase the Lexus and keep it for 10 years versus, versus the Tesla Model 3. And you can see there's a price difference of $38,000 over 10 years, pretty significant. SUVs, they pit a Volkswagen ID4 against a Honda CRV. And it takes four years and eight months for this because apparently the CRV, and these are Canadian dollars, just so you know, uh, the price for the CRV is pretty aggressive right now. So I guess Honda is trying to uh, make a move in this market. But even still, after four years and eight months, and um, they also go with the longer range. This is the Volkswagen ID4 Pro. Uh, so it's a little bit more. Um, it does have 332 kilometers of range, so that's what they were trying to pit against each other, and that's why the price is a little bit higher. Uh, still, over 10 years, um, the Volkswagen is less expensive, uh, break-even point at four years and eight months, and you can see the reason why in these two columns. Basically, fuel cost is uh, the main reason. And lastly, trucks. Already cheaper for the uh, Ford F-150 Lightning in Canada versus the Ford F-150 XLT Super Crew. Uh, the price out of the gate is a little bit higher for the Lightning, but again, the rebate uh, knocks it down below and you're immediately starting to save money. And the total ownership over 10 years is 77,000 versus 117,000. So a good solid $30,000 less over 10 years. Now, I can't really overstate the importance of price parity. We've been waiting for price parity for a couple of years. Some people have been waiting for it for 10 years. There's a lot of people in the EV community who have been uh, hoping for this moment to occur. And uh, a lot of naysayers say, well, you can't really go EV because it's going to um, break the electrical grid and our whole nation depends on the grid. So if everyone goes EV, there won't be enough energy. And I do want to bust that myth because the Canadian government in a cited study to the, um, to the one for the price parity uh, in a separate study analyzed what would happen during an adoption rate. And in 2050, which is 25 years from now, they would see a 22% uptick uptick in the um, consumption from the national grid for electric vehicles alone. So in 25 years, 22%. And what they're saying is that's not at all of a concern because when you spread it over 30 years and um, the first 10 years in order to uh, get adjusted uh, is really not that big of a deal. So the concept that we're going to collapse the grid by this rapid adoption with EVs is just not backed up by the um, studies that have been done. Anyway, I hope you found this video as exciting as I had. It's a uh, seminal moment for electric vehicles. Really, it doesn't matter what the politics says. This is household economics. Thanks for watching.